Abe and I thought it was best if in, uh, we talk about uh, some of the or the central work he's been doing in his uh, creative uh, writing, thinking, experiencing the last uh, couple of years. And uh, it also happens to be central in the uh, in the exist meaning of existentialism and existential psychology. Now, I don't think it's, uh, we would all agree that anybody has to worry about uh, whether he labels himself an existentialist or not. I think those who label themselves existentialists are generally the least existential of all of us. And this is why in the movement, quotes, uh, uh, which consists from Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, uh, Jaspers, uh, Heidegger, Sartre, Tillich, Berdayev, Marcel. Nobody in that whole outfit wants to be called an existentialist except Sartre. And Victor Frankl, incidentally, uh, would like to be called that. Now, it doesn't matter what you're called and uh, whether or not we label you thinking existentialist or not is the least relevant thing of all. But what we're after, what I am, I, I told some of my well, the New York State Psychological Association, when we had a uh, meeting in our convention on existentialism, that I was so much in doubt about the word, frankly, that on the even days of the month, I thought it was a useful word, <coughs> and the odd days of the month, I thought it wasn't. It should be dropped. I don't think it should be dropped, because it has a tremendous richness. But we don't at least have to worry about labels. Now, what you were saying last night is, to me, uh, the central existential concern problem. Uh, and as I will indicate later, I was thinking during the night, uh, during a very good sleep, <laughs> I uh, was thinking of uh, the fact that Kierkegaard, the uh, pioneer of the existential movement, made exactly this point against Hegel. It's an amazing thing that I want to come to later point about the gap between actual between potentiality and actuality this is the way it's put in historical philosophy now um, what you were saying last night as I understood it was that what was interesting you was these days the uh, gap between what we are at any given moment and what we might be it was the gap between potentiality uh, and actuality, and that this gap uh, was central in creativity. As a matter of fact, it could be defined as the creative process, it seems to me. And that the being state that you have done so much uh, work on and so much uh, very creative thinking on is the state uh, that uh, all of us arrive at sometimes and some of us more than other times. Perhaps many of us in our culture, at least, who are caught in uh, boredom, ennui, the deadness of our culture, arrive at practically never at all. But in any case, the being state is the state when this gap uh, is, at least temporarily, overcome. And what we are uh, now is uh, identified, at least as much identified as it can. What it really is, and that's another question. That we have to work on. Mm -hmm. But for the, in the creative moment it is, identified with what uh, we can be, that is with our highest thoughts, our uh, sharpest perceptions, our most true perceptions of, of wisdom, our uh, most uh, beautiful perceptions of, with respect to art and so on. Now, I would uh, think it very good for us, if you would go on and tell us more about your thoughts along that line, and then I have some uh, contributions to make that I think will help us, uh, you and me, and I hope you, and perhaps all of us, in uh, moving down this, uh, the problem of this gap. Now, if I haven't made it clear, let me say that I think this gap is the whole existential area. See, the meaning of existentialism, from Kierkegaard down, the most amazing thing, how uh, you talk, you were talking last night, the paraphrase of Kierkegaard, that this gap is a difference between 
uh, in Western thought and psychology, a static psychology, whether that static psychology is materialism uh, or idealism, as it was with Hegel. If it's static, one or the other, you're dead. And the existential problem is not either one or the other, but the uh, tension, the struggle, the creative anguish, if I may already beg my question, <laughs> in between. <laughs> now, with that introduction, uh, will you shoot away and we'll stop you. And later on, incidentally, we thought perhaps after the uh, discussion gets going, 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever, we'd want to bring you all into it so we can talk about these things together. Uh, as Rollo was talking it, uh, about Kierkegaard, and, uh, which I had not read, uh, it occurred to me that in this time and place, uh, it's worthwhile uh, saying that, uh, saying something about the operations from which uh, my statement has come, uh, and to stress in response to that question, uh, that was brought up last night about science and so on, which has been perseverating with me all night long, uh, that my statement is an effort to, uh, well, not to paraphrase Kierkegaard or anything like that, but an effort to throw into some kind of abstract and generalized form actual data that I've had, uh, mostly with <coughs> mostly with uh, very ex exceptionally healthy uh, human beings, self-actualizing human beings, on the one hand, and on the other hand with uh, mostly studies from studies of uh, peak experiences of various kinds, mystic experiences and love experiences and insight and creative experiences and the like. And these sources of data simply can't be understood unless you uh, make some kind of differentiation between uh, a behavioral statement, you know, what you actually see, uh, or what a tape recorder can hear, and what a movie camera can uh, record, can see, uh, that kind of actuality, that sort of surface thing which is before your eyes and your ears and your fingertips, so to speak. And on the other hand, of deep uh, dynamic forces which are uh, trending in another direction, which is not explicit. Uh, yearnings, perhaps, that's a better word. These deep dynamic forces which are yearnings uh, towards something which has been called in various ways by various non-scientific people uh, the higher life, uh, the spiritual life, uh, the religious yearnings, uh, the philosophical yearnings, uh, and so on. Uh, and because these yearnings and these trends could not be phrased in behavioral or in positivistic terms, have generally been rejected, uh, cast out of the realm <coughs> of human cognition, science, even in the broadest sense, and have been turned over by abdication to, well, all the sorts of people who are uh, contrasted with scientists, uh, poets and dramatists, uh, religionists, uh, philosophers, um, all of these words spoken with slightly sneering connotation because they're not scientists, and therefore what they say doesn't really amount to much can't rely on it. It may sound good, but you can't believe it exactly, except by an act of faith, which is then defined in that context as being slightly uh, silly, not needing evidence, you know, and so on. Well, uh, just in the same way as we can define existential psychology, and I would prefer to say psychology in general, you know, uh, as uh, very largely a study of the tension between or the conflict between or the resolution of these actualities which we are at the moment and in this particular point in space and that which we might become, could become, 
and dynamically, at least in Kurt Levine's sense anyhow, are actually trying to become all the time that uh, psychology is the, certainly in large part, the study of uh, the dynamics of this situation, this kind of dialectic, you might call it, or conflict or whatever. Uh, this has been contrasted also, I saw some time ago, that the humanities were defined by a committee of uh, distinguished uh, humanists, meaning again non-scientists, uh, essentially, uh, defined, the humanities were defined as the study of the human predicament, uh, which was then defined as the gap between, they spoke about gap rather than uh, create attention, uh, between uh, what human beings actually are, uh, which is not terribly much, and uh, what they could be, what they might be, uh, what they admire, so to speak, and uh, because of their admiration, which is this uh, something which is in a certain sense part of them. Who defined it that way? Uh, this was a committee that was headed by uh, Mumford Jones. Of Harvard. Do you remember that uh, yeah, yeah, the big committee that the Council the of uh, Learned Societies uh, made up to try to uh, define the relationship of the humanities, meaning certain departments in the universities, <laughs> uh, which was their operational <laughs> definition. It's contradiction in terms. Yeah. Uh, they said it with a straight face, though, I must say. Um, and the difference between those departments and the departments which were labeled uh, science, and which were obviously very, very far apart and lived in two worlds and had no relationships with each other. Well, I think that we can put together, as scientists in a redefined and much broader sense, we can put into the same world these two worlds of these splits, of on the one hand, uh, knowledge and uh, religion, on the other hand, science and poetry, science and the humanities, perhaps. Uh, or uh, what is probably even a more basic statement is the, uh, the dichotomizing of fact and value. These two also can be tied together in, uh, in a kind of dialectic, uh, which puts them into the same realm of human thought, accessible to the thinking, meditating human being. Well, um, I, I, again, I want to play the scientist here as much as possible, because this is one of the roles I've chosen for myself. It's very important for me, is to try to build a bridge between all these things that I love very much, on the one side of poetry and art, art especially, music, and so on, uh, which seem very, very real to me, which I just simply can't somehow, I've never been able to put into the realm of uh, illusion or of uh, momentary uh, pleasures, uh, like running on a roller coaster or something of the sort. Uh, and on the other hand, that which is equally precious to me is, is the is truth, the truth as uh, defined in the ordinary way. Now, it seems to me that these are also truth. They are for me. And uh, part of this process of uh, reconciling within one's skin, or a rather complicated human being with different sides, and trying to make it all come together into a single person, uh, well, this work of mine has been sort of an externalization of that internal effort uh, to put uh, art uh, and uh, philosophy, which I love, uh, and all these other things into the same uh, realm of discourse. No, I think it, I think it's, I think it can be. And to, to some extent, I think I've been able to do it, at least satisfactorily for myself. I'd like to uh, say against this, this, this kind of introductory overall statement that 
the point that I would recommend for study, the point that's been uh, most uh, easily accessible to me, uh, and that I think would be to you, uh, would be the study of these peak experiences, uh, which are the, uh, like the crucial experiment, you might say, uh, in certain of our experiences, our ecstatic experiences, Rollo prefers to call them, and uh, Lasky uh, has also preferred to call them, and I think historically, you're right, historically this is the more accepted term, these ecstasies uh, which have been described best by the old mystical writers, but uh, these days uh, we're getting all sorts of uh, <laughs> unexpected groups of people to, for instance, I find the richest source of my data now are uh, women in natural childbirth who give me these fantastic statements that uh, I get echoes from St. John of the Cross, the same, uh, same words sometimes of a woman reporting how she feels or felt, I've got them uh, retrospectively, uh, how she felt in the moment of conscious childbirth. Uh, very profound ecstasy, very profound mystic experience, you might say, uh, that in this moment, all of these dichotomies which we have learned to take as polarities seem to come together. Possibility and actuality, uh, the, the yearnings and the fulfillment, uh, the striving and the completion, gratification, and so on. Uh, these women say, uh, for instance, one of my subjects was, uh, greeted her husband who came to see her immediately after the baby was born and this woman was still uh, wrapped in clouds of glory. Um, and she announced to him very firmly, this has never happened to anyone before. <laughs> and that, <laughs> if you meditate on that, it, it says an awful lot of things. That should be of importance to us as psychologists, I would think, even when we're trying to be very sober um, and uh, very cognitive and so on. Well, in these peak experiences, I would say that uh, the peak experiences have proven to me and have, have pushed me out of my ordinary way of thinking, away from our normal polarities and opposites and dichotomies and so on, which is our way of thinking as psychologists. You know, everything is right on a continuum, on a scale. You have a lot of extroversion, that means you have a little bit of introversion and so on and so on. Uh, that somehow that way of thinking just isn't right uh, for the best conditions, or I can say that in another way, is I've learned to think of that way of thinking as certainly true and real and so on at a kind of a mild level of psychopathology at which we are, all of us, most of the time as we walk through the affairs of life uh, with you know, with pinching shoes or with uh, an appointment with the dentist for tomorrow and uh, with, uh, we've run out of cash and have to cash a check at the desk and so on. And, and little things like that which are pressing and which are prepotent, I may say, the press for attention, uh, but which in themselves don't really amount to much and they're not very great experiences that uh, the, well, to, I think I'm talking too much, to jump to the end of what we were talking about last night, uh, this was over the magic creative brew. At the <laughs> <laughs> and that fosters the higher uh, intellectual life. <laughs> It's called Schlitz, I think. <laughs> That's why we call it spirits. <laughs> <laughs> that um, uh, Rollo and I um, talked about the, uh, the older 
well, what I've tried to do is to, in order to put this into a phrasing which could be worked with, which could be put to the test and so on, uh, talking about the, uh, what the old uh, medieval mystics used to talk about as the unitive consciousness, the unitive life, uh, which is a great generalization from the peak experiences to include an awful lot of other things as well. That is to include our, uh, let's say, saintly behavior, what they used to call saintly behavior in daily life, or what the Zen Buddhists uh, lay great stress on, is the living in satori, living in nirvana, or the various phrases, it, as you walk through life, as you just do these things about dentists and shoes and bills and earning a living and so on and so on. And this would be uh, another solution uh, to this problem of the creative tension between possibilities and actualities. And this is, it runs something like this, and then I think I'll consider that a basis for discussion. That if we label uh, the, our lives of uh, moment to moment and uh, spot to spot, uh, our restriction in time and space as individuals and so on, if we label that the life of deficiencies of the many, many words that I've tried to use as a label for the whole realm, that seems, uh, it's not perfect, but it seems best. Uh, the realm of lacking something, I call it deficiencies in that sense, the realm of deficits, of wants, you might say, in the, in the strict sense, wanting something, meaning lacking something, uh, and which would mean then the realm of, uh, of instrumental behavior, because when we, when we lack something, then we, we try to get it. So this would be then the realm of striving, of motivation, uh, of need, which also implies you're lacking something, if you need something. We might call that for the moment the D realm, the realm of deficiencies and deficits and so on. And then contrast with that this world of uh, perhaps platonic essences, you might call them, of our possibilities, of our, our yearnings, uh, the sense in which uh, there now exists presently in us uh, love for truth, uh, a love for a preference for beauty is over against ugliness, and a preference for perfection is over against chaos, and uh, and a yearning for uh, true justice is over against uh, injustice and the like. Uh, in the sense in which those possibilities are those values are extrapolations out from what we actually feel, what we can actually demonstrate. I've written a paper which will be published in about a year, which is for me a kind of a, a triumph for myself, where I demonstrated this to myself. It's called The Need to Know. See, that's this lacking something, the need for knowledge, the, the wish, the want, the deficit. Uh, the need to know and the fear of knowing, which describes, or I tried to describe as dialectic, of uh, to explain in a certain sense uh, why, if you judge the human species by the newspapers and the history books, why they are such a bunch of stinkers, uh, is the second, uh, why in fact, though they have these yearnings and, uh, in, the, on, in the good choice situation where you can actually see it, have these yearnings for these higher, uh, these best values, why in fact they don't achieve them, is certainly part of our job to explain as psychologists of psychopathology. We must, this, is, this is our duty. Uh, why in fact, though you can easily demonstrate, just take a look at my paper and you'll see the piling up of evidence from about 13 different sources, I think it was, about the need to know as a true biological instinct-like need in the human being. Um, and then the question comes up, why is, if we do love the truth so much, and if we do need to know it and prefer it and so on, then why in fact are we such a bunch of dopes throughout history? Why do we avoid truth? Why do we get easily fooled and so on? 
that, by the way, leads to another thing, which I'm sort of in the middle of, is uh, the different... I don't think we know enough about truth, uh, really, about the different kinds of truth and the different kinds of lies, uh, falsehoods and so on, uh, and I'm uh, playing with that. Uh, I think that can, that's feasible, that can get done. I have a wonderful source now of data I decided not to bother with interviews and so on. I just simply have the television for the various kinds of falsehood. Uh, <laughs> and um, <coughs> then can actually observe by introspection in myself the way in which I can get used to falsehood and not mind it, get over the indignation and the revulsion and so on, and sort of get used to it finally, uh, which is our, I think, our problem. Well, this unitive consciousness is much like what the Zen people have talked about. What is the possibility for us human beings of being able to live under the aspect of eternity, you might say, in the actual world of deficits? To what extent, one analysis that I tried to make, to what extent can I see women and men as the sacred, holy, perfect things that they are, are, in a certain sense. Uh, uh, I, I know it's easiest to see with babies, <laughs> uh, who have not yet lost so many of their possibilities, uh, but it's, uh, it's possible to see even with adults, uh, to be able to see the woman uh, simultaneously for what she may actually be, um, with all her idiocies and what she might become. Yeah. Well, now, could I, I think that's, uh, propose a uh, question here that comes directly out of what you're saying and also about the, some of what we have talked about? Uh, and this is the problem of the relation of what you are saying to anxiety. Uh, now, what Kierkegaard uh, the problem Kierkegaard faced was that he saw very clearly, as other people had seen too, this gap. But what he saw around him in the psychologist was that they just leaped from one to the other, and uh, it, so this could be done very simply. Now, they were idealists or they were materialists, and uh, there was no problem. Now, he attacked Hegel. Uh, with great uh, violence here on the assumption that Hegel was engaging in trickery because Hegel said, Hegel was the dominant expression of middle 19th century psychology and uh, philosophy and in many ways religion. Hegel said, you get from one to the other by thinking. Now Kierkegaard said that's trickery. You can't do that at all. He said what Hegel says is simply you go from what you are your potentiality to a new actuality, and that's all there is to it. I said, Kierkegaard, the most important thing of all is the determinant between. And then came this tremendous statement that you find all the way through Kierkegaard. I think it's the whole meaning of Kierkegaard, that actuality, what we are, translated into potentiality, and the middle determinant is anxiety. Now, angst. That's a lot more than what we mean by anxious. Angst here is a <coughs> tremendous creative and positive force, as well as what we call negative anxiety. And this is the meaning of, well, I think it's the central meaning of Kierkegaard. The middle determinant is angst. Now, uh, then Kierkegaard became, was, I think, one of the two or three greatest philosophers of all time, I mean psychologists of all time, uh, around this point. This is what we've got to find. Now, I said, Kierkegaard, this is the dynamic between the two. You see, what you are talking about seems to me to, uh, would be stronger if you had more of what the actual phenomenological di dynamic is between the two states. And I said, Kierkegaard, therefore, you can't say you just get there by thought or by salvation. Sure, you do by salvation, but that's a religious dimension. Uh, and it doesn't, and it may happen only occasionally, or by satori. But you get there by something 
that all of us experience, namely angst. Now, this is why Kierkegaard brought in will. See, not simply thinking, but willing, decision. Because you won't be able to meet your angst by thought. You can only meet your angst by courage. Oh, uh, by courage. See, Nietzsche said, error is cowardice. Now, you have said something like that, too. Uh, but these men are saying, Schopen, this is what meaning Schopenhauer's will, that our just thinking won't do it. One has to commit oneself. The whole idea of commitment is to meet this intermediary determinant, which, says Kierkegaard, is anxiety. Now, this is something altogether different from Zen Buddhism. And I think, see, I have a good deal of respect for Zen Buddhism. I've uh, worked on it with Suzuki. I, I know something about it. I have experienced uh, such religious experiences in my own Protestant tradition uh, uh, myself. Uh, but I think a good deal of our thinking about Zen Buddhism and Western culture is also trickery. Now, that, I don't mean that as a scandal, but I think it's a way of escaping. Because in the Western culture, we simply are in different skins. Uh, this is why C.G. Jung says that you uh, always avoid the real issue when you bring something from another culture. He's talking here about his introduction to one of Suzuki's books, uh, Zen Buddhism, because our real problem is not how we would be if we had lived for three or four centuries in the Orient. Our real problem is, is a, a Western man in the middle of a disintegrating and deteriorating civilization which fraught with uh, anxiety. Now, I think our problem is something quite different, as I say, from Zen Buddhism. It is Satori. I think that confuses us. I don't, I'm not critical of, of this. See, uh, and this doesn't mean disparagement of Satori if it's really Satori, which takes 20 years of 24 hours a day discipline. Uh, and I think there's no way short of that. Now, that's not you and me. And not very many of us, not even Suzuki. He, uh, he believes he has not had it. And Fromm believes he has not had it. Now, our problem is anxiety. And I would, let me just add, as part of my question, I have talked to quite a few artists on this problem. I do quite a lot of painting myself, and I've been very much interested. I've lived for some years in this milieu of artists. And the, what the great ones tell me is that they do, even in their best work, experience anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it's the anxiety of a kind of birth and death. I remember W. H. Auden, uh, was, uh, and I were talking about this one day, and I said, now, he knew, he certainly knows about all these uh, things, and he, I said, now, do you experience anxiety when you're creating? And he said, I do all the time except when I'm playing. Now, we can play creatively. Mm -hmm. This is what Picasso does with these little statues that he makes of his children and his and, uh, roosters out of wood and so on. At the same time, he is painting Guernica. Now, Guernica is the anxiety, the despair, and guilt that we Western men have got to live with, but it's terrifically heavy. Mm -hmm. Now, he takes it out by playing. And all of us, God knows, got to have something like that. Now, I think in creativity, there's also, that there's always uh, this angst, and our, dist our question is the distinction between the, the destructive angst, which is neurotic anxiety, which is certainly not health, not creative, and the creative angst, which is the dynamic to the potentiality. Now, a barren, you see, a, if you want studies of creative people in an empirical sense, you find some awfully good stuff by Frank Barron, uh, perhaps, to my mind, the first really good empirical studies of uh, creative people. Now, Barron found in his, these studies that the creative people were characterized by the capacity to tolerate anxiety. They liked the uh, pictures and so on, or the cards that were disturbed that, uh, that created anxiety in your typical businessman. Businessmen put them aside. The creative people picked this stuff up. They were able to tolerate, live with anxiety, tension, and out of this anxiety to um, chaos, 
the anxiety caused by chaos, to create new form. Now, this is why the creative people are more original, more interested in novelty. They dare. You see, they have courage. They leap. This is all Kierkegaard stuff. Now, I have a, an illustration from a patient of mine in psychotherapy uh, that I want to give in a few minutes, but I would want you to talk first on anxiety. Um, I certainly must agree in general uh, that the, the data that I have uh, confirm what you say, that uh, the, for instance, to talk, I uh, somewhat different phrasing, uh, to talk about creativeness without talking about courage is really nonsense. It, uh, it simply doesn't work uh, to talk about creativeness as if it were kind of a lie sitting there waiting for some kind of inspiration to strike, for instance, which is the picture that so many people have of it, just isn't so. Uh, creativeness uh, is very often, especially in its earlier stages, a very great struggle against uh, fear and uh, anxiety and uh, uh, the feeling of danger in general and of loneliness, which we ought to add there also. Um, and then finally, the, the, uh, the courage, uh, which makes it possible, the courage or the stubbornness, uh, which makes it uh, possible for these people whom we call creative to stick it out and to go ahead and to carry this through. I was interested, I was trying to say last night that I think one interesting uh, empirical study that uh, can be made, ought to be made, is that this uh, great, this great cosmic struggle uh, between uh, fear and courage is apt to take place in the first stages, the, um, it's like the first step, you might say. Um, if you've seen the visual image that I get here is of a little toddler just learning to walk, and uh, if you've watched to such children taking the first step and the second step and so on, you can see certainly there's a great deal of wobbling and what we could see almost as anxiety. Uh, the child tries a step and then he did, holds back and clings to his mother's finger perhaps and so on and then he manages it and there's usually some kind of rooster crow of triumph of some sort and then the uh, little one goes wild, running back and forth and trying out all, all his steps and so on. What I mean to say there is to use that example, show that it's in the first defloration, we might call it, uh, that the, this, uh, this great struggle between anxiety and uh, courage uh, will come, and that then there's apt to be of great feelings of triumph, and the overcoming, the great overcoming of anxiety and the disappearance of anxiety in the delight over having achieved the triumph. Uh, last night, we, when we talked about this, um, I brought up uh, in turn this puzzling uh, phenomenon uh, that I've been getting, uh, which I think also we ought to take seriously. Uh, the question of uh, the role of, uh, of this uh, creative conquest, this uh, act of courage, this leap there, uh, as a kind of uh, death. Uh, if you work with peak experiences, sooner or later you're going to get a fair amount of reports to you in all sorts of unexpected situations that this was like a kind of death, a feeling of dying, uh, but a sweet death. Uh, which uh, in our culture we don't talk about. Death is supposed to be just bad. Um, but uh, so many people have said to me that this must be what dying is like, and it's not so bad after all. It's very nice. Um, or it can be said in other ways, this will never happen again. It never could happen again. It's just too unique, too perfect, too high, and the like. Uh, so that they say rather frequently uh, in these reports, I could die and it would be all right. Now, um, the conception of the uh, 
of this great moment of faith or courage or leap or whatever you want to call it as a kind of dying uh, certainly should ring uh, all sorts of reverberations uh, for those of you who have studied uh, the various religions where in the conversion experience one dies to oneself or one gives up an old self in favor of a new one uh, and also those of you who have studied mythology at all know this are very familiar uh, with the notion of the death which is necessary for the rebirth to occur. And then I would suggest those of you who think deeply about psychotherapy had better start thinking in terms of death and rebirth also. Uh, and what we've been talking about here, just uh, so we could, if we wished, apply this discussion that we've been having to the process, to the schema of psychotherapy. Uh, the conflict between uh, let's say, no, the, the love, the wish to know and the fear of knowing. The wish for virtue and the fear of virtue. The wish for making justice uh, retroactively to, let's say, your father who was 12 years dead, perhaps. And on the other hand, the, all the uh, repressive forces, the fear forces, the unwillingness, the reluctance forces, which, uh, prevent you from doing it. If we manage to break through, whether in psychotherapy or in these other experiences, if we manage to break through, if we're courageous enough, if we have strength enough uh, to bear the depression and the, as well as the anxiety which comes upon us whenever we hit any crucial insight, where there's a kind of a death of something, some old self perhaps, or some part of ourselves, uh, that this uh, can be seen uh, as a sort of well, creative tension, Rollo called it. I've been calling it a dialectic, uh, where this, uh, this statement about death and rebirth is uh, it's not a bad schema to encompass a good deal of it. Uh, that would certainly build in to the structure of what we were saying, the anxiety in its various senses. By the way, there's an eager anxiety too, of course, uh, which again, we don't find in our textbooks any place. Uh, the, the eagerness um, which uh, well, if I can go back a century, this is sort of obsolete now, but let's say the, the reluctant, trembling, willingness, eagerness, fear, anxiety, with which the uh, uh, Charles Dickens uh, virgin heroine went into sex for the first time. Nobody goes into sex for the first time now, as nearly as I can make out with my college students. Uh, this is... Uh, no longer an all or none affair. Um, kids who get engaged at the age of eight or something. Um, <laughs> that, but it's, it's a beautiful example, if I can go back in history, for trying to describe this uh, welter of emotions which are conflicting as one steps forward and then timidly steps back and so on, uh, which describes pretty well uh, Many of the, it describes our insight experiences fairly well. It describes our creative experiences fairly well. It describes the, the love experiences fairly well. The same falling in love, um, being simultaneously reluctant and eager and stepping forward and stepping back and being tremulous and being eager and so on and so on. Um, it describes also the, uh, the crucial moments, many of the crucial moments in psychotherapy. Uh, I would say also in education, <coughs> kind of education that means something, um, and so on. So that this, um, if I added to what Rollo said, uh, the, you know, Rollo talked about the anxiety and the courage uh, side of that uh, picture, uh, which we must accept just no question about it. 
uh, I would add there the death and rebirth kind of uh, thing, and then think of growth, the kind of growth that we're interested in in psychotherapy and in education. Uh, and as I would now add from my uh, summer's experience in, in this uh, factory that I'm working in, uh, the work uh, the work situation can also be the same kind of growth affair, uh, that this had better be seen uh, as a much more complicated thing than simply walking up, uh, uh, walking up the side of a hill. Upward, upward, ever upward, you know, one step after another. There's kind of a big fight all the time that's going on, a very complicated one. I think I would agree also with this. Uh, I've never been critical of the Zen Buddhists um, I think partly because I never took them very seriously. Uh, that is, I, was, I could use them, I think we all can with great profit, uh, for what they have to offer us. I know that for myself I've always translated it into terms that uh, we could use as psychologists and simply dropped away the, uh, the naivetes and the old phrasings that are obsolete now and so on. Uh, the Satori uh, kind of thing, uh, which comes at the end of a lifetime of discipline and struggle and so on, is certainly not. As a matter of fact, I think my work with the peak experiences is alone disproven that as the, as the proper schema for uh, reaching the higher life. Uh, so that doesn't work. But the real problem there one problem that the Zen people have brought up and that we ought to talk about is the problem of <coughs> reaching, of being aware of the higher life, so to speak, all the time. Yeah. In the middle of chopping wood, I remember there's one example. Uh, uh, one monk asked the uh, great uh, wise leader, uh, what would you do if Satori came while you were chopping wood? And the wise man said, I would continue to chop wood. <laughs> and that's a very good answer uh, for us who are not aware enough of this creative tension between uh, the B realm and the D realm. You know this? Yeah. And this, I think, we can learn more from the Zen Buddhists than we could from, uh, let's say, the mystics, uh, who didn't have enough sense of the most of them anyway, of the interpenetration of the eternal life and the daily life. Uh, the uh, platonic, of uh, living with the platonic essences perhaps, and living on your particular street, in your particular job. Uh, Abe, uh, I have known one had left that I'm critical of Zen Buddhism as well, such. I have to be somewhat of a different, of a different question. I entirely I'm agree with you. Yeah, in Huxley's article, uh, quote, The Island, which uh, I think in some ways uh, doesn't come across. But the, the phrase through that, that they have the minor birds saying, here and now, boys, yeah. here and now. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is one of the uh, rich parallels with the existential uh, point of view. Zen Buddhism has so many rich parallels, the existential point of view, that uh, I think uh, that's just the reason we want to avoid mm -hmm. an oversimplified uh, identification, which I think confuses. It's the problem of anxiety at which, I mean, the leaving out of anxiety at which this oversimplification generally occurs. Now, let me... Oh, can I interrupt here, yeah. uh, Rollo, as you speak, a good phrasing. Uh, certainly that here and now, I, this is certainly what we must all stress, and as a matter of fact, you're that basic encounter group that you're discussing last night and so on, I would think would be the chance to dig in on that here and now, to become more intimate and deep and experiencing with a few people. Yeah. Uh, and I would think would be a very desirable thing to try. But supposing we say that in some paradoxical way, that it's exactly the here and now which gives you the experience also of eternal and ubiquitous, that is, of being outside of time and space. Now, just yeah. try to make something out of that. Here and now, 
here and now is supposed to be well at this moment, this instant, this spot in time and space. Yet if it occurs as we are thinking of it, uh, because I know we're thinking of the same kind of experience there, true experiencing, which is always very, very per perfectly concrete, that yet uh, this ought to be uh, the experience of uh, eternity, of the eternal in space and time both. Yeah, that's the interpenetration. Yeah. I think it is the definition of eternity, actually. Well, now, uh, I think at this moment it would be better if any questions or feelings no, you have. No, you were going to say something about a case that you had. Well, I, 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 uh, if I don't say it this morning, I'll say it tonight. Uh, but, uh, and perhaps I will later on in the discuss this morning, I think it, it's a case of a patient uh, that illustrates very much the life and death business and is around the uh, symbol also of orgasm. Mm -hmm. See, the, the uh, experience of orgasm is a profoundly significant in all of this. Uh, and without going into this case, I want, but I only like also to make another thing clear. Uh, I think we must uh, not fall into the uh, oversimplified way of associating the anxiety of creativity with the fear of starting. Now, what you did was to give two different kinds of anxiety, what you were saying the last few minutes. The anxiety of the child before he could walk, or this girl before uh, she can give herself to her husband. Now, this is one kind of anxiety. This takes the leap, uh, at least the initial leap, and one kind of anxiety. We're afraid to walk, to move ahead, and so on. The anxiety, especially I was talking about, is the anxiety that the, uh, the men who are arrivé, that Picasso at 62, 65, still has while he's painting. It's the anxiety that, not that you have when you are afraid of sex, but when you are with somebody you genuinely love and are in the process of sexual relations, the process of the sexual intercourse itself, uh, then uh, there is out of the depth of meaning the shaking of your existence. You see, if this is a real sexual uh, relationship, if it's real love, a real passion, and the hell of it is nowadays, you see, there's so damn much sex without any passion, yeah. without exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you do it as though, I told one of my patients, as though there's simply a, a tool made of iron or wood or whatever that goes from his penis down here, right straight up to his body, to his head. And he's aware vaguely that something is happening. But I said to him, the great pity is that uh, uh, you have so much sex, but you never have, you do so much sex and never really have any. This guy's uh, problem when he came is when he was impotent. For a very good reason. So now I think so he screws everybody. It's solved. There's nothing is solved at all. The fact that he wanted to screw everybody all his life, exactly why he was impotent. Now, um, the, uh, you see, the real anxiety that I am talking about, the creative anxiety, is the anxiety that occurs out of the depth of relationship. If I really love somebody, really give myself in sex, and so on, then uh, there is a shaking of my uh, whole self, the shaking of my pattern, shaking of my work. You know, in, in Hemingway's, Farewell to, not farewell to Irons, but Spanish book. Of whom the bell tolls, when he and this girl he's in love with make love. The old Spanish woman, when they come back from the fields having made love, she said, did the earth shake? Now, not only the earth shakes, but our earth shakes. And this is a, a constructive anxiety that comes out of the shaking of the foundations of uh, the I and thou relationship, and I think it's the anxiety that comes of death and rebirth, and is symbolized, at least, by the experience of orgasm, plus and conception in nature's terms. Now, uh, that's an anxiety that is present in the creative act, even when I'm doing my best. It's still there. In fact, I've given myself over to something 
more tremendous than I am. That's onyx in its positive sense, birth of potentiality. Now, I'd rather that we now have a general discussion than if I, this is the case, why not give some time later if not now. What are your reactions? You had a point, did you? One of our problems in the modern uh, West in the 20th century that the B experiences uh, are apparently met and solved by D methods, particularly the method of grabbing at a uh, technique. This is uh, such a fascinating paradox to work with. If you like this kind of, if you like playing with these things, I suggest you play with this problem. It's almost like one of the Zen koans, you know, of uh, how you can get someplace without trying to get there, and therefore passing through the period of artificiality and phoniness. <laughs> there is an inevitable uh, chamber between being a dishonest man easily, and being an honest man, easily. That chamber is trying to be an honest man, and this means being gawky, artificial, phony, pretentious, pompous, hypocritical, and so on. But there is no other way to do it. There simply isn't. And uh, I've, uh, I know one of the effects upon me of uh, trying to work out this thing and then of uh, finally having to accept this necessity that you can't <coughs> jump as an electron is supposed to jump from one state to another state without passing through anything, uh, was to become much more respectful and uh, much more compassionate, I guess you might say, about these intermediate stages of trying. Uh, so that, for instance, I've learned <laughs> It might be an unexpected consequence. I've learned to like uh, bad art more than I used to. Uh, <laughs> because somehow it represented, it can represent occasionally, not when it's pretentious, of course, but it can represent occasionally this, this sacred effort, you know, to, to improve yourself, to move over into this other realm. And it can be used uh, for pedagogical for theoretical purposes. For instance, if I think of us all as, uh, well, this I learned from a particular girl, a uh, girl whom I was uh, working with, not in a therapeutic relationship, uh, was a student, but working with in other uh, assistantship relationships. So some, something about the girl disturbed me. It's a very pretty girl, very well formed, very nice, very good taste, and so on and so on. And yet, uh, I couldn't simply enjoy her. It always, there was some uneasiness which I had to trace down. Uh, and finally it dawned on me in a big click. That girl is acting like a female impersonator. <laughs> <coughs> 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 And then many things float from that inside. As the poor girl, she doesn't feel like a girl, obviously. Uh, a girl who feels like a girl doesn't walk, doesn't try to walk like a girl, she just walks, and then it comes out like a girl. <laughs> and very nice it is, too. But it wasn't in this girl who was trying to walk like a girl, and that didn't look good. It looked more like, a, let's say, the male homosexual, the, the pansy type who tries to walk and then it's not attractive, not pleasant to watch. Uh, well, we can, and then I went on with this and I've got four categories now. Uh, the female, female impersonators, the male, female impersonators, the male, male impersonators, and the female, male impersonators. <coughs> and this can be generalized to include, I'm afraid, all of us, the human impersonators. <laughs> Um, and then it helps to make the differentiation, which I've learned to make, which is certainly very helpful for me, between, even for therapeutic patients, uh, between the one who is sickish, let's say, who is troubled and so on and so on, who needs help, but who has a good prognosis because of trying in the right direction. You know, the one who's struggling towards something whom we all spontaneously respect more, and it taught me to recognize as a, 
to phrase it in another way, is that probably the most profound sickness because I could do nothing whatsoever about it. It's totally incurable. That is to be satisfied with oneself. <laughs> not to try, not to strive. So striving becomes then, this kind of striving and trying, becomes then a mark of uh, in a certain sense a respect-worthy human being. There's another stage, namely the person who tries to be something but at the same time is hostile toward and hates the thing that he is trying to become. Could these emotions that we've been talking about up here, anxiety, guilt, uh, struggle, and so on, uh, be classed as regression? Uh, are they really a regression to a more conglomerate, primitive, in a certain sense, a respect-worthy human being. There's another stage, namely the person who tries to be something but at the same time is hostile toward and hates the thing that he is trying to become. Could these emotions that we've been talking about up here, anxiety, guilt, uh, struggle, and so on, uh, be classed as regression? Uh, are they really a regression to a more conglomerate, primitive uh, emotional state? de-differentiated. De this, uh, I find this an extremely interesting and important problem to work with. I must say that I think part of the problem comes from the, part of it is a semantic problem imposed on us by Freud. Uh, no, the truth that lies in the Freudian concept of regression, and it, it, there's certainly uh, no, no doubt about the truth, that this, the Freudian regression does happen. Uh, the trouble is that the Freudians, uh, several of them, have fastened upon us a kind of an extension of that use of the term, which uh, makes unnecessary confusions. Uh, I know I, I tried myself in this, uh, I don't have time to speak about it here, but in the, the, the book that I have, which just came out a couple of months ago, there's a discussion in, in this book about regression of different kinds. And one of them that I deliberately used was regression forward, to make the distinction between regression backward and regression forward. Uh, and the regression uh, forward, uh, which, uh, for instance, Ernst Kreese talked about as regression in the service of the ego and so on, which is a really a rotten phrase. It, it, it saddles on our shoulders too many theoretical presuppositions that we shouldn't want. Uh, that this, uh, in, there, in any case, he tried talking about the recovery of something which we have lost, as if this were a regression. Now, if we describe, as we have to, if you describe the, uh, the uh, desirable human being, that is in terms of his own intrinsic uh, development, uh, for, for instance, the kind of, if you make, as I tried, uh, from uh, the Carl Rogers, uh, the Pendle Hill pamphlet, I think you have that in your new book, don't you? Uh, I don't remember the name of the chapter, but I've called it the to and from chapter. If you, if you uh, add together all the things that uh, uh, Carl said about what his patients are moving toward, and then you simply make a syndrome out of them. Uh, this makes a very nice picture of health as far as it goes. You, we can add to it and make it more complicated. Uh, now, you'll observe there that many of those things which the therapeutic patient moves toward are really, uh, can be conceived as, as a recovery of some things that have been lost. For instance, like certain aspects of childlikeness, of naivete, of trust, and so on and so on. Well, the Freudians call that regression, but I don't think we should. I don't think we ought to get stuck in that trap there. This is a progression. Uh, it's a moving on to a kind of a, a higher naivete, you might call it. Santayana, I think, called it the second naivete of the wise old man who can become in some ways like a child. Um, <clears throat> could I also say that I'm awfully glad you brought this point up, um, and if I can be very uh, gross, uh, because I've thought about this a great deal, there's no point uh, I disagree with more radically than that what we're talking about 
uh, can be called regression. I think not only did Freud uh, give us a confusion, and it's much more than Freud. Freud didn't really, because Freud always kept the mythology uh, that saved these terms from this mechanistic confusion. But we dropped the mythology in the Atlantic as we imported psychoanalysis to America. And so we've lost a great deal of Freud's creativity. Freud really knew better, but uh, American psychoanalysis of the Freudian type seems to me has uh, not only contributed to a semantic error, but much more than that, namely has interpreted these uh, peak experiences, the emotions that go with them, uh, in these uh, primitive, regressive, negative ways. Uh, not only is this true in the service of the ego of Chris, see how Chris struggles here, to, Chris knows also that such a thing as art is, and then he tries to do all these things with it. Now there's much more here than a semantic difference, it seems to me. It seems to me there's the whole radical difference here that again is one side of why the existential movement was necessary, namely that modern man, in his devotion to the mechanistic, the reductive forms of thinking, See, in psychology and psychoanalysis, the uh, mecha modern mechanism, modern Western mechanism, takes the reductive form. I can understand how I love by seeing how the monkey does it. Or I can, uh, my emotions now, my altruism, is a uh, reaction formation, a sublimation. In fact, that this is the way the patient at Freud first got the idea from. Surgeon, now he sublimated the fact that as a kid he cut the ears of sheep off. Now, uh, what this really does, you see, is to set up a whole system by which you destroy even the possibility of somebody's being human. Because by definition, then, these experiences are uh, to be reduced to something less than human. Now, Satra, no matter how much one may disagree with Satra, Satra came out eloquently and brilliantly and profoundly, I think irrefutably, on the issue that the big mistake in psychology is that trying to reduce the human being to something a pre-human. This you find in this little book misnamed Existential Psychoanalysis. Now all the existentialists said that the big error in modern civilization from the middle of the 19th century on was that industrially, scientifically, uh, emotionally, and religiously we are dehumanizing man. Now, this is the technical way of dehumanizing man psychologically, namely to interpret these emotions that we're speaking of as regression. Now, um, I think this, as I say, comes out of the fact that uh, classical Freudianism, as it has come into America, has had no real basis for understanding the uh, opposite to the archaic. See, in any symbol I have, there certainly is an archaic element. But there's also, in every symbol I have, a progressive element that discloses new reality, new meaning, um, and these emotions, the anxiety and so on, uh, that I'm talking about, that, say, that you have in the sexual relationship, is not at all what the monkey has. It's something that you can have only if you're human. That's why the, the meaning of love and tenderness, that. Uh, is a, it has some specific relationship to human sexuality. Now, um, I would say that the anxiety I'm talking about is not de-differentiated, but is more differentiated. And I would say it about each one of these emotions. The guilt also I'm talking about is not primitive and de-differentiated, but is a higher form of sensitivity. I think I'd add to that, if I may, just the one that um, I'm certainly agreeing with that, uh, as a more, much more advanced statement than the one I made. I think I would add that uh, uh, in, the, in the progression experiences uh, that there is the experience of integration of the whole emotional life with the whole of the cognitive life as well. That there's a huge integration. And it, it's a meaningful thing to say that the human being becomes one, more unitary in these high moments and high times uh, than at other times. Is not the 
intermediate determinant there, the phoniness, that the person is trying to make something of himself, and the tr problem is that he cannot give himself over or let himself be made something by inner forces welling up within himself and by uh, uh, what is designated in other areas of faith. I, I think that most of us have to try most of the time, in addition to having these conversion moments or for instance, I think that the current stress among the Freudian psychoanalysts uh, less and less on the dramatic moment of insight and more and more on the working through. Uh, I would be echoed by good uh, psychotherapists of any school that uh, so much of psychotherapy is, uh, it, it's not the leading up to some great <coughs> insight which then remains forever. Uh, but it shifts back and forth. You have to struggle with it. You have to keep trying to do it. You have to uh, uh, apply that to different situations and so on, which can be a highly conscious uh, experience. And in that sense, uh, taking over uh, by the will, by, the, uh, by ourselves as executives, uh, uh, controlling ourselves uh, for a period of time until these things become uh, spontaneous. Spontaneity has a prehistory, is another way of saying uh, what I'm saying, a little like uh, learning the piano. You have to be very conscious about all your fingers and so on. Eventually, hopefully, you can forget about it. Uh, I have uh, put that in, uh, formulated that myself in the, uh, this way namely that these bursts of insight, ecstasy and so on, it certainly does involve more than trying. You're, you do have their powers that come from within yourself, but outside, I think, also, reality. That this comes only to the people. This is why insights, incidentally, may come in moments of relaxation. Come, they come only to the people who have fully committed themselves beforehand. That means if we fully try, then also, or in between, or whatever, uh, if you do your best, then the grace of God, God helps those who help themselves. The grace of God comes to those who uh, are fully within themselves committed, if I can put it in our religious terms.